So where have we been? With the, the first time I did this lecture, we talked about how evolution is absolutely impossible, right? That we had those four kind of pillars to evolution, that in order for a materialistic evolution, so evolution without God to be true, uh, that, uh, that the universe had to begin with a big bang, um, so it had to come from nothing. You had to have, um, uh, the earth had to be really, really old, that life had to begin by accident, and that mutations needed to improve the species. And systematically, I showed you, now all four of those have to be true, but systematically, I showed you that not one of them are true. And then that allows us to be able to know that God created. But the, the issue sort of is, if, if God created, then God is good. And if God made his creation according to who he is, he would make a good creation. Then why do we have the, the crappy world that we have today? Well, the reason is because of the introduction of sin. Sin destroyed everything. In, in uh, Romans, it says that, in Romans 8 specifically, it says that creation cries out for the resurrection of the sons of man. We have ruined the world because of our sin, that even creation itself longs that God will restore the original beauty of his creation, his original plan, the original order and goodness that everything was there. But we still have a paradise. How did it get from that to this? And that's our progression. Today, we're going to talk about what life was like before the flood. It was very, very different. And we'll see how because of that difference, it created a big problem for God, a problem that God had to solve with the most drastic of solutions. It was the equivalent of him hitting the reset button on a computer. He had to wipe everything out and start over. It was that bad. So let's see why and how it got that bad by talking about what life was like before the flood. So the very first thing that we realize in Genesis 4 is that Adam and Eve are now no longer going to be alone. That Adam and Eve at the end of three um, are, are going to be fruitful and multiply following God's original command upon creation. That that's what they were supposed to do. That's always what they were intended to do. So Adam and Eve have kids. This is, I had a better picture. Oh, well. One of those things, I guess. Are you sure? Where did you get this? Did you get this from Genesis? Okay. All right. Well, they proceeded to have the first child, and the first child they named Cain. And the Bible, you name People based upon the meaning of the name. The meaning of the name of Cain is spear. You know, the big stick with a pointy end? Spear? That's an odd name for a child. Right? I'm going to call you sword and you gun. Right? <laughs> Why how would you do that to your children? Well, probably because Eve had never experienced childbirth before. And all of a sudden, she got, woo! She got pain. And this head being pushed out of her. And Adam, like, what do I do? Something! Anything! Right? And nothing. He's just a guy going, push it out, shove it out, way out, push it. Out. That's all he can do. Right? Awful, awful experience. So she named him Spear. Right? And then. The second child, she names Abel, and Abel means breath. Why breath? Again, no idea. Maybe it's because this time he, he, he took her breath away while giving birth, or, or maybe it was like, wow, we're, we're experiencing new life, new breath, right? Who knows? Who knows? So we have Cain and Abel. And most of you probably already know the story of Cain and Abel, but I want to make sure that you understand the deep theology that's behind it. Oh, this is not the right file. I know it's not the right file because I fixed this. Anyway, it doesn't matter. Then Abel proceeded to become shepherding sheep. Now, I, I want to ask you a very, very important question. We know that as they rise up, that, that, that Abel becomes a shepherd, and what does Cain become? Does anybody know? A farmer, okay. Now, I want to ask you a very, very important question, and that is this. What does a shepherd do? What's a shepherd's job? 
Okay, the shepherd is supposed to take care of the sheep, all right? So the shepherd is supposed to, as my son said, make sure the sheep don't die. Okay, what could kill a sheep? Eating all the grass around it, not moving forward because the sheep is dumb. Yes. What else could kill a sheep? Wolves. That's definitely what could kill a sheep today. But back then, what did wolves eat? All animals prior to the flood, all animals were vegetarians. There was no meat eaters. You needed that many animals just to be able to mow the lawn. Okay? So if a wolf is eating grass, and a sheep is eating grass, and cows are eating grass, and lions are eating grass, which is why the lion could lay down with the lamb, because the lion wouldn't eat it. Right? If everyone's eating grass, what are you protecting the sheep from? Themselves! Because, as Evan and my son are, keep alluding to, sheep are dumb. Do you know that sheep are the second dumbest land animal on the planet? The first is a turkey. The second is a sheep. Sheep are so stupid that if one sheep fell off a cliff, all the other sheep would be like, hey, that looks like fun. And then they'll go and fall off the cliff. Sheep are so dumb that as Evan said, they will eat all the grass around them and then stay there. I wish I had some grass. They could move two steps forward and eat, but no. They stay put until someone goes, get. Sheep are so dumb that if they fall over, ugh, they lie there and will die there until someone helps them up. Sheep are stupid. And what does the Bible compare us to? What's the Bible saying about us? We are dumb too. Because we'll see someone sin, and what do we do? That looks like fun. And then we all get in trouble. We all end up with the same problems. So is Cain's job hard? Compare that. Oh, sorry, is Abel's job hard? No, compare that to Cain. The Bible says in four, at the end of 4.2, but Cain became working o'er the ground. What does that mean? Cain was a farmer. And remember what God said at the end of chapter three to man. You will work the ground for your sustenance, but what will the ground give to you? Thorns and thistles. Anybody ever worked a garden? Anybody ever planted a garden? I suck at it. I'm terrible at gardening. I have a black thumb, not a green thumb. So I'm not good. But like we have a garden in our home and I'm so bad at it. Like the, the plants are overgrowing on top of each other. It's just a mess. I just look at it like, I, no, I can't fix that. Okay? But one of the things you have to do with a garden is you have to constantly go out and pull what? Weeds. Now, the Bible says that God removed the curse, yet we still constantly have to go out and pull weeds. This ground is cursed, which means you're intentionally planting a fruit tree, and what is it going to give you? A thistle bush. So if you know anything about thistles, that's a thorny plant, and what do they not have? Gloves. So you've got to go out, get stabbed with the thorns in your hands, rip that out of the ground so that you can be able to make sure your fruit tree will grow and not be choked out by the thistles and thorns that want to grow up instead because the ground was cursed. Now, what does a farmer do? Grows crops. Question, what do people eat? The crops. What are they not eating? Lamb chops. So what does Abel's job do in comparison to everybody else? Yeah, basically using the sheep, but also Abel's job 
is maybe using an animal for the sacrifice and clothes. That's it. You need that maybe once a year, right? How much do you need Cain's job? Every stinking day. So who is really doing the harder job? Cain. If Abel decides to take a break, what happens? They're there, right? Okay, one sheep might be on his side for a little long, but that's kind of it, right? The next day, you can always push the sheep a little bit further and there'll be more grass, right? Not hard. If Abel takes a break, what happens? Yeah, or sorry, if Cain takes a break, what happens? They die, right? You don't have food, you starve. Okay, you miss some meals. This is the the world in which Cain and Abel have grown up in. And the Bible says it's time for them to be able to produce a sacrifice. And here's what I want you to understand. Look at what it says in uh, how I translated it. It says, then Cain proceeded to come from fruit of the ground an offering to Yahweh. But Abel had come also, he from the firstborn of his flock. Now, often people make, I think, a very grave error here. And here's the error. It's the error I heard when I was a child. That when Cain came and brought his fruit, he didn't bring God his very best. He brought God just a little bit, right? Oh, I really like that peach. I'm not going to give him that one. Uh, Maybe this one over here. And and that part of the problem is that Cain wasn't really giving God his all. I think that's a bunch of crap. I don't think that's what's going on here at all. I don't think that's what the text is saying. It says that Cain proceeded to come from the fruit of the ground. He brought, I think, God his very best. God, this is what I've done. This is the sweat of my brow. I've done this in spite of all of the thorns and thistles that I've had to pull out. I have worked hard and I'm giving this to you, God. This is my best. And what does Abel go and do? The firstborn of his stupid flock. Yeah, he brought God the best, the firstborn. I mean, that's cool and all. But how much did he do for that firstborn? Oh, there it is. Here, God. Who, from a human perspective, gave God the better offering? Cain. But it says, then Yahweh proceeded to gaze to Abel and to his offering. What? Why would God honor Abel's offering, who did virtually nothing, compared to Cain, who had to work his tail off just to give God the very best. That is odd. And the answer is, it's not the pride in what you do. It's the faith in who Yahweh is that matters. You can't be good enough to go to heaven. You can bring God your very best, but what God needs is perfection. And you're not perfect, and I'm not perfect, and nobody is perfect. And the result is because of our imperfection, which we know as sin, it requires a sacrifice. And what Abel had done was to bring a sacrifice a lamb that died and shed its blood, reminding him of the person who would come and shed his blood on the cross, the Lord Jesus Christ. That blood is required for forgiveness. Hebrews 9.22 says it. Without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. It had to be the shedding of blood, and that's why Abel's sacrifice was the superior sacrifice. He was not honoring what he did. He was honoring what Jesus would do. You understand? That's very important because Cain was pissed. He was mad. What? 
Why is God choosing that crap over this beautiful sacrifice that I have tried to give him of the sweat of my brow? And God says this. It's very, very important. God says this to Cain. He says, why has your face fallen? But if you don't proceed to do good, sin proceeds to be lying at the door. What is he saying? Cain, you knew what I wanted. You knew what my expectations were. Why is your face falling, falling since you didn't give me what I asked for? Not a sacrifice of your work, but a sacrifice of a substitute for your sin. If you had done good, then that, this wouldn't be a problem. But you didn't. You chose to do it your way. And when you choose to do it your way, do you understand what, I'm sorry, I'm going to be off camera, but you understand what's happening. Sin is at the door. Sin is just waiting. It's itching to come in and play, but it can't come in unless you invite it. And when you do good, sin is kicked out. But if you decide your own way, sin is right there to say, hey, let's play, let's have some fun. And the result is sin will always, always cost you more than you want to pay. Sin will always take you farther than, one, than you want to go. Sin will always keep you longer than you want to stay. It will always hurt you in the end. It promises so much and it always under delivers as you end up scarred and hurt because of the choices that you made. Then Cain decided that he was going to fix the problem and he thought the problem was his brother. So he brought Abel out into the field. The Bible says then Cain proceeded to talk to Abel, his brother. Then Cain proceeded to rise to Abel. Then he proceeded to murder him. He picks up a rock or stick and beats his brother to death. Why? Well, he learned it from dad. It's not my fault. It's his fault. He stole God's vision from me through his sacrifice. And so he beats his brother to death for it. What is the opposite of love? That's what people say. It's not true. Hate is not the opposite of love because God is love. And the Bible says there are six, six things that the Lord hates. Yea, seven is an abomination unto him. See, hate isn't the opposite of love. Do you know what the opposite of love is? Pride. Because love places others above self. What does pride do? Places self above others. Love says, I want you to thrive, so I'm gonna do what it takes in order for your needs to be met, even if it costs me something. Pride says, I need to get mine. I need to make sure I have mine. And so if you enter into a loving relationship with your future spouse and you say, I need to have my needs met first before I meet yours, that's a prideful relationship and that's doomed to fail. But if you say, I want to give all I have for you and for your benefit, and your spouse says, but I want to give all I have for you and for your benefit, that's a loving relationship and both of you will thrive. Cain murders his brother because he doesn't love Abel. He loves himself. And he followed the original sin of the enemy. The enemy became a murderer as well. He murdered Adam and Eve by tricking them to eat the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Cain follows Lucifer and murders his own brother. Well, God has something to say to that. God asks Cain, hey, where's your brother? Where's Abel? You know what his response is? What, am I my brother's keeper? I don't know. I hate when my kids say that to me. That Fortunately, they don't. But if I ask them a question, hey, what are you doing? I don't know. Well, did you do well on your test? I don't know. Well, how was school? I don't know. Do you know anything other than I don't know? I don't know. Drives me nuts. 
It's been a long time. Hey, where's your brother? I don't know. I'm my brother's keeper. I have to watch him. Uh-huh. What's the answer to that question? Yes, you are. We are our brother's keeper. Our job is to make sure that other people are doing well. It should not be just about us. It is not me, myself, and I. That would be like playing one song where the entire note was me, 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 me. That would be a crappy song. So we need to be looking out for other people. And God knows exactly what Cain has done. Question, if God knows exactly what Cain did, why is he asking the question? Give him a chance to repent. Give him a chance to say, God, I I didn't listen to you and I have royally screwed up. He didn't. He said, I don't know. I don't know. So God says, what have you done? And this is very important. The voice of blood of your brother proceeds to be calling to me from the ground. The reason why that matters so much is whenever in the Bible, in the Old Testament, blood is plural, the blood is where it's not supposed to be. Whenever the blood is where it's supposed to be, it's singular. So if the Bible talks about blood in your body, that's where it's supposed to be, it's singular. When the Bible talks about a war in which you shed the blood of your enemy, well, that's where it's supposed to be, so it's singular. When it talks about the sacrifice of blood, it's singular. When it talks about murder, it's plural. You have shed someone's bloods because it's not where it's supposed to be. God says this because you proceeded to work the ground. It will not proceed to be caused to increase and give strength to you. You're a farmer, no more. You get to be a nomad. You're gonna have to wander around because the ground is not going to produce the fruit that it wants. It's for you, it's doubly cursed. So you're gonna have to find food wherever you can. And what does Cain do? Instead of saying, God, I'm sorry, I screwed up. I know I was wrong. What does he do? God, this punishment's too hard. And I wonder, someone's gonna know what I did and they're gonna kill me. Hello, maybe you've thought of that before you took your brother's life, but no, it's going to be too hard. I don't want to wander. I want to be protected. Help me. God says, all right. So what God did was mark Cain. We don't know what the mark was, but he gave some form of physical indication so that anybody who saw Cain would know two things. That's Cain. Stay away from him. Because if anybody tried to kill Cain because Cain killed Abel, then God said, I will put a a punishment seven times more upon that person's head. So that mark indicated stay away. And so he did. And what did Cain do? He left. Cain proceeded to go from before the face of Yahweh, which is very important. He never again turns back to Yahweh. He never repents. He never sacrifices. He never tries to make it right. He tries to run from God's face. Can you run from God's face? No, because he sees everything. But the action means that he, with intent, decided to do things that would keep God out of his life so that he felt he would make himself happy. And then he proceeded to settle in the land of Nod, which was east of Eden. Where is the land of Nod? And who is in the land of Nod? Well, A lot of people read that and say, didn't Cain move to a populated area? The answer is no. Nod simply means to wander. And he went to a place that became known as Nod because that was the place where uh, Cain wandered around. And he, in 417, built the first city. Okay, so he no longer can, can be a farmer, but what he decided to do is if he can't stay then he might as well help his family stay. So he ends up building houses and things for his family to be able to use as they proceed to be farmers in order to make food that he can be able to eat. People go, whoa, 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 whoa. Who who did Cain marry? Who did he marry? Well, the Bible says 
that, Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. So who did he marry? His sister. Now, I know a lot of you are like, ew, that, what? That's gross. That's incest. No, it's not. The original incest of the Bible was when a father stole his son's wife or when a son stole his father's wife. That was incest. But having brothers and sisters marry at this point, especially in creation, is not a problem. Why isn't it a problem? Because as you proceed to have successive generations from Adam and Eve, like we are, I don't know how many generations, but maybe a hundred generations removed from Adam and Eve, the further you go away from the original source means the more information along the way that you've lost. And if I end up marrying my sister, I don't have a sister, so this can never happen. But if I did, she would have a lot of lost information. I would have a lot of lost information. And if we married, our children would have even more lost information than both of us, which means they would have severe medical problems. That's why it's a problem today. Back then, their genetic code was still pretty much intact. They hadn't lost so much because of the mutation Um, over time and the adaptation and and, and trying to survive in different environments and things. It's one of the reasons why, and, 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 and sorry to spoil your parents' future for you, but if you have mixed race children, they're gorgeous. Why? Because that's information that's gained. You put the information from two different places back together, and now all of a sudden it's like, dang, mixed race kids are just hot. They're stinking gorgeous. One of the most attractive presidents that we ever had, people said, was Barack Obama, mixed race. Tiger Woods, one of the best golfers of all time, mixed race. Right? They're super hot. Super smart, super athletic. So if I could just get one of my kids to marry like a half African, half, you know, I'll have the Uber race. I'm kidding. I'm just kidding. It's that's a joke. Okay, don't. I'm not a Nazi. That's not. Okay. Now the rest of Genesis 4 has to do with um with the generations of Cain. Okay? And here's the important thing to know. What did it say about Cain? Cain did what? He went away from what? The face of God, the face of Yahweh. He did not want to follow God. Well, if parents don't want to follow God, what kind of hope is there for the kids? Not much. So every descendant of Cain is evil, wicked, Horrible, no good, very bad, okay? Cain built the city 417. He ends up having a son by the name of Enoch. Enoch has Irad. Irad has Mahuhael. Mahuhael has Methushael. Methushael has Lemek. Lemek was a piece of work. What did Lemek do? Lemek had two wives. Apparently one was not good enough. So he has two and he kills two men. He kills one man because the one man wounded him. So maybe the one man tried to kill Lemek and Lemek paid him back in spades. Lemek actually murders the guy who tried to hurt him. But then he kills a boy just for striking him. So maybe it was a father-son or maybe it was just some boy that was like, what'd you do that for? Whack. And then Lemek's like, and he's like, hey, if Cain got sevenfold for killing me, I just killed two people. God is gonna pay back anyone that tries to kill me 77 times. Like murder is a good thing. You see how wicked these people are becoming, right? And then you have the son, uh, then Lemek has two sons of his, of his one wife, Ada. He has Jabel and Jubal. Jabel is the father of tents and livestock. He's the first cowboy, right? He starts being a herder. And then Jubal is the father of the flute and lyre. He's the first rock star. He's a musician. Right, then you have the sons of Zillow, that's Tubal Cain. He's the father of bronze and iron. That's your blacksmith. And then you have Nema is Tubal Cain's sister. So what do you have? You have the invention of 
herding animals. You have the invention of music. You have the invention of a blacksmith. They knew how to work with bronze and iron far before the Greeks and Romans. That was lost technology that was rediscovered, not technology that was invented. This guy, Tubalcain, invents it. Now notice, all these guys are what? They're sons of Cain, which means they're inventing stuff, but are they good? No. No. Yet, who also was very, very good with the flute and lyre? He was also a king, David, which raises a very important issue, and that's simply this. What you use and what you do is not what gives something a quality of good or evil. The fact that you drive a car doesn't make cars good or evil. The fact that you play an instrument doesn't make the instrument good or evil. The fact that you have a job, you're an engineer, you're a doctor, you're a lawyer, doesn't make it good or Well, lawyers, you're evil, but no, I'm kidding. The job itself doesn't make it good or evil. It is how you use it. That's what gives it its quality. The invention of livestock, evil. The invention of music, evil. The invention of blacksmith, evil. But you could use all of this as David did for good. Why did God choose these people? Well, the answer is they're the ones of note. God wanted to indicate how bad people were getting. Him having two wives, killing two men, producing children, obviously not going to be great people. God is pointing out the problems with society. That's why. And as we're going to find out, these people are living uber long lives. How do we know that? Well, then she, that's Eve, proceeded to have a replacement child for Abel. He has Seth. What does Seth mean? Seat. Why? Because he takes the place of Abel. Abel was honored by God, and I think Abel, because of the sacrifice, was chosen to be the progenitor of the Messiah. Since he's dead, he can no longer do that. So Seth is going to sit in his seat. That's why he's given his name. That's just my theory. Because God seated him another seed uh, below Abel because Cain had killed him. So that's putting those, that verse all together. And this is the cool part. Because Abel had died, we don't know how many years apart Abel, would, Abel died and, and Seth ended up being born unto Eve. But nobody was worshiping God. Nobody. And then Eve has Seth. And it's through Seth that we get 426, a very important verse. Then he, meaning Seth, had intensely begun to call in the name of Yahweh. The worship of God kind of stopped with all the descendants of Cain. It wasn't until this new descendant came that we finally had God being placed in his proper place of worship. And then you have five. This is all of five in a single slide. All of it. What happens? Adam at 130 ends up having Seth and he lives 800 years after that, which means he dies at what? 930 years old. You thought your grandparents were old. Okay? Seth has Enosh at at, at age 105. He ends up living 807 years after that. He dies slightly less than Adam at 912. Enosh ends up having Kenan lives to be 905. Kenan has Mahaliel. He ends up living to be 910. Mahaliel, oh, he died in his youth. Look, he only lived to be 895. He had Jared. Jared had Enoch. Enoch and, or, and ends up living or dying at 962, oldest man so far. Enoch, what happens to him? Wait, he lives only six, 365 years? Was he the guy that um, uh, Lemek ended up killing? No, he was not. Enoch 
ends up having, he, he you know, had the earliest child at Methuselah, uh, of Methuselah, uh, and then lives 300 years after that. Methuselah, 187, has, has, a, has the good Lamech at, at 782. He dies, at, Methuselah dies at six, 969 years. He almost made a 1,000. He was just 31 years short. So sad. And then Lamech dies at 777, being the father of Noah. And Noah is a very important name, means rest from work. Noah ends up having three children by the age of 500. So we don't know how old he was when he had each of them, but by 500, he had all three, and that was Shem, Ham, and Japheth. And then years after his son, in total years, we, the, that chapter doesn't say. But notice that you add up all those ages, all those red ages. How old was the earth? 1,459 years. 1,459 years before God decided enough is enough. What do you mean enough is enough? Notice all those people in all those lives. How old are they? They're hundreds of years old. You take a man who walks away from the face of Yahweh, 65 years of his life. You know what he ended up doing? Murdering six million Jews. A total of about 20 million people. Who am I talking about? Hitler. But he's not the only one who did something like that. Stalin ended up walking away from the face of the Lord. He ended up murdering 50 million people. Chairman Mao ended up walking away from the face of the Lord. He ended up murdering, we still don't know the full count. The estimates are somewhere between 75 million people or 100 million people. How long did these guys live? 70 years? 80 years? How long are these people living? And if they're never following God... What kind of evil can they devise? Wickedness that you could not imagine. We wouldn't want to imagine. And that's what God is looking at on the face of the earth. Why did Enoch not die? He walked with God. He walked with God so well that God said, hey, why don't you just come home with me? And so Enoch literally walked into heaven. Amazing. Now, some people look at this and go, oh, that, that's impossible. And so they say, hey, um, maybe they didn't live so long because they can't imagine it. Well, why did they live so long? Here's a theory, and this is a really good theory. I really believe this. They lived so long because the earth was protected by water. Remember what God did on day two. What did God do? He separated the waters. He didn't just create water. He separated the waters. He separated the waters from the waters below. That became seas. And what did he do with other water? He put it up in the sky. He put it up in the firmament, not as clouds. The Bible says, how did the earth get water? From the dew of the morning. From water rising up from the heat of the ground and producing dew on the grass in the coolness of the evening. That's how the earth was watered, which means they didn't have clouds in the sky. What did they have? A water vapor canopy that surrounded the earth. What did that canopy do? Two very important things. One, number one, it provides low UV radiation. How many of you have ever gone to the beach before? How many of you have ever been sunburned at the beach before? How many of you have noticed that when you got sunburned, no, stop it, Siri, I didn't say anything to you. 
your, your Siri, not sunburn. So how many of you, when you ever got sunburn at the beach, noticed what didn't get sunburn? Your legs that happened to be under water. Water blocks UV radiation. The part of you that was out of the water ended up getting sunburned. Which meant if water surrounded the whole earth, what did you not get? You did not get sunburned. And if you did not get sunburned, guess what also you didn't get? Wrinkles. You didn't get wrinkles. Why? Because here's what happens. When I go out into the sun, it's like this ultraviolet radiation is BBs. It's just pelting my skin. And when you're young and youthful like you, your skin regenerates faster. When you're getting old like me, the sun is winning. And you develop wrinkles. And my wife goes crazy because she doesn't want me to have wrinkles. I look old. She doesn't want me to look old. She wants me to be the husband of my youth, of her youth. So she prays, begs me, please put on screen, this sunscreen and these lotions and potions in order to keep being young. And I keep telling her, I've earned these. I drive my wife crazy. You need to pray for her. The sun is winning. So I'm getting more wrinkles. And the more I'm out in the sun, the more wrinkly and leathery my skin will become. But the water vapor canopy also does one more very important thing. If it is surrounding the earth, then atmosphere is not escaping into space. It's trapped in by that covering, by that blanket, if you will. And it heats the earth so you don't have things like the polar ice caps. You do not have wild changes of weather. What you have is a tropical paradise. What you have is what you have in like Kauai. Kauai it rains there more than any other place on the planet. Kauai is the wettest place on the planet. It is also volcanic soil, which means it's rich in nutrients. And so if you take a plant because of the weather that's there, it will grow like a weed. It will all of a sudden take over the entire island, which is why even though it is United States soil, they do not allow vegetation from outside of Hawaii to come because they're afraid that it will ruin their island. They're very careful about what they plant and where they plant it, okay? So you have all of this, this water vapor canopy that turns the whole earth into like Kauai, into like a greenhouse paradise. Plants flourishing, growing, huge. What are you going to need in order to keep the trees from, from destroying everything or overcrowding everything? You're going to need some dinosaurs in order to eat the trees, in order to clear out areas of land. You're going to need huge animals that can be able to do that job. That's why God made everything big. When you have a, 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 a lot of, of water like that surrounding you also create, and a lot of plant life, you also create what's called a hyperbolic oxygen chamber. What does that do? A hyperbolic oxygen chamber means your blood is super saturated with oxygen. You could run farther and heal faster than you ever could before. There was a little girl, I think it was around the 90s. I don't know if you remember this story, Chris, or not, but you, you probably will remember it if I tell it to you. Uh, we grew up here in, southern, in, in this area, so, so we remember a lot of stuff. There was that little girl that fell down the well. Do you remember that? She fell down the well, and she pinned her leg in this really weird position as she fell down, and it made it that they could not go down and, and pull her out because it would destroy her leg doing it, which meant that they had to drill in from the side and carefully be able to provide room to pull her out properly and, and she wouldn't lose too many, too many of her bones. When they pulled her out because she was in that hole for so long and they had to be so careful about drilling it at an angle, she already had gangrene on parts of her body. They were thinking that she was going to have to lose maybe one or two limbs. It was that serious. And then one of the doctors said, hey, let's try this. Let's put her into a hyperbolic oxygen chamber to see if we can reverse some of the damage. And they created this special machine which super flooded the entire atmosphere in it with oxygen and they laid her in that oxygen chamber. 
And she stayed there for a couple of days, sedated. While she was there, her body re reversed the gangrene. She didn't have to lose any of her limbs. It healed itself. So broken bones would heal faster. Skin diseases would heal faster. You wouldn't have skin diseases in the first place. Everything was better. That's why they were living longer lives. Another reason, though, why they were living longer lives is because they were all vegetarians. Now, I do not think that you should all run out and become vegetarians. Hear me now. I love meat. Where's the beef? All right? Love meat. I am a meat eater. I am a carnivore. I am an only an omnivore because I also like certain types of fruits. But otherwise, I would just stick to the meat. Now, they were vegetarians. Meat eating is good because of our condition on earth now. But back then, they didn't need to eat uh, a lot of meat. And the reason why they didn't need to eat a lot of meat was because you didn't have all that ultraviolet radiation breaking down your body, requiring you to have so much protein in order to restore your cells. Most of what they could get, they could get through plants. And they were specifically told not only to eat the plants, but also, hear me, they were supposed to eat the seeds. The seeds of the plants. Well, why does that matter? Do you know that if you eat grape seeds, they're nasty, they taste awful. But if you have a grape and you chomp on that seed and you eat it, do you know that that grape seed works as a natural antibiotic against all forms of sickness? So one of the things that some nutritionists encourage you to do is if you're ever getting a cold, take grape seed. Like a, like a vitamin. And it will help your body heal faster. Here's another thing. If you end up, do you know that, have you, any of you ever eaten a peach or an apricot before? You had something like that? Okay, when you eat a peach or an apricot, do you know what's in the, at the center of that thing? It's called a pit. Okay, peach pit. Now, do you know that if you take that hard husk and you crack it open, there's a seed inside? Do you know that if you eat that, that's a natural anti-cancer agent? It's like a natural antibiotic. Not an antibiotic, sorry, a natural chemotherapy. But it's not a chemotherapy like what we do, where we just pump your body through a poison, like dropping a nuke in order to kill a hummingbird. Okay, it is a natural version, which means your body actually likes, tastes awful, by the way. Don't, ugh, don't unless you absolutely need it, don't eat it. But you could, it could be used as a natural agent in order to try to heal the body from cancer. There are other natural remedies as well. Ginger is another one where they're encouraged to eat or you're, we should be encouraged to eat those types of roots in addition to our normal diet, which I know a lot of you are like, oh, I hate the, the my parents always come up with these weird concoctions of things that we should be eating whenever we're sick or something. Do it! I'm telling you, especially in Asia, they probably have kept a lot of that healthier medicine than some of the, the, some of the toxic stuff that they've come out with in the West. So you might say, wait a minute, are you one of those voodoo witch doctors, Pastor Daniel? No, I'm telling you, in Asia, you have people living hundreds of years. What are we doing in the West? We're dying at 70. Do the math, Okay. So don't throw out a lot of that Asian medicine. Now, some argue against this and say, well, what if they counted the, war the years differently? Like, what if, what if in our day, you know, we say a year, that's 365 days. They were counting, you know, a year as like 30 days or something. Like, they're months or something like that. So Adam didn't really live to be nine, 930. He really more like lived to be 93, right? Well, don't you see what the problem is? If that's true, then how old was Adam when he had Seth? And you might say, well, okay, but Adam was created as an adult. Yeah, but what about Seth? He's having children at 10? And Mahalia? At six and a half? I don't think so. No, they counted the years the same. Otherwise, you have big problems when you start figuring out when they had children. Well, what happened to that water vapor canopy? Where'd it go? 
it rained for 40 days and 40 nights. So it poured out upon the earth. People then ask, well, wait a minute, where'd the water go? Still there? We call it oceans. Still there, we call it clouds. Now, here's an interesting theory of mine. Again, this is just a theory. A lot of people are raving about global warming and they're worried that global warming is gonna kill us all. What if it doesn't? One, I will tell you, I, I, I'm, I don't buy the arguments about man-made global warming, okay? I, I don't think that, that's a thing. But what if it was always part of God's design that at some point the earth would get warmer? And what if it was always part of God's design that eventually that water vapor canopy might one day be restored? And that literally when the Bible says it will be like the days of Noah, that it will be like the days of Noah, where we no longer see severe weather, but we are protected once again by a canopy that would make people live longer, therefore making it so that they will do wickedness like you would not believe. What would God have to do to such a world? He'd have to destroy it, but not with a flood because that would only reset, same problem. So if he doesn't destroy it with water, what does he destroy it with? Fire. God nukes his entire creation. Here's what I wanna do. Next week, I want you to come with questions. I want you to come with questions about the flood. I want you to come with questions about theology. I want you to come with all forms of questions about anything you want. You can ask me those questions in advance. You can wait for them and ask me that day. What we're going to do is what is called a jump start. Here's what happens. This is what happens at the jump start. What you're going to do is you're going to ask me questions. I will start the jump start with the common questions that everybody asks regarding the flood. We'll just sort of get those out of the way, right? Because people, I know what you're gonna ask. I know one question that everybody asks. Every time I do this seminar, I always have people asking me this question, and that's this. Where are the dinosaurs in the Bible? Right? Why doesn't God mention dinosaurs? Well, I have an answer to that. It's a really good answer, but I'm gonna make you wait until next week before I give you that answer. So you're going to answer, I'm gonna answer that question, I promise you. I'm gonna answer a number of common questions that people have about dinosaurs. Like if there were dinosaurs with man, why didn't Noah bring them on the ark? You'll find out next week. Yes. No. Nice try. Don't steal my thunder. Okay, um, but you don't have to just reserve your questions about creation, evolution, and the flood. You might have other questions about the faith. At some point, I'm gonna just open it up to you and then I'm gonna let you guys drive the questions. If you wanna email me in advance because you do not want to, you're a little bit afraid about asking the question out loud, that's fine. But what I'll do otherwise is I'm gonna have Aaron run around with a microphone and he's just, you, you're gonna raise your hand and then he's gonna walk over to you and he's gonna hand you the microphone and then you're gonna ask your question. And I'll just field it for as long as you wanna go. If we go over 9.30, we'll go over 9.30, right? But we'll just go for as long as you wanna answer these questions. I had one group, I kid you not. They were like, oh, Pastor Daniel, is it, is it okay if we like asked you questions for like 45 minutes? And I said, yeah, yeah, that'd be fine. They said, really, isn't that too long? Yeah, I don't know if our kids are gonna have that many questions. It's, it's okay, we'll, we'll, we'll do it, we'll do it. They ended up asking me questions for two hours. Two straight hours I was fielding these questions and we had to cut it short because it was dinner time. But they wanted to keep going, okay? This, this, is the, this is the time for you. You can ask me anything you want. You can ask me about my personal life. You can ask me about... Um, the faith, whatever it is, it's all in your camp in order for you to be able to feel comfortable about all the things that we've talked about. And we'll just do that next week and that will wrap up our creation versus evolution seminar. What was life like before the flood? You had one godly line, one. And here's the thing. It says that Adam and Eve had sons and daughters. 
So it wasn't just Cain, Abel, and Seth. They probably had Larry, Moe, Curly, and others as well. Okay, think about it. You're living 900 years. You have no television. What are you doing for entertainment? You're having kids. You're having hundreds of kids. You're living hundreds of years. But how many of them are following God? One. One line. With a majority of them following whom? Anyone but God. How long are they living? How long? 900 years. And what are they doing? Horrible, horrible wickedness. Evil is growing in depth and breadth to such an extent that God has to say enough is enough. And after about 1,400 years, God hits reset with the flood. And the big reason why the flood was so important is because he says, I need to make it so that their days are only going to be 120 because 900 is way too long. That's why God did what he did. And it was the flood that wrecked everything. Think about it. Before that, before that event, the earth was on top of water. You had all kinds of underground oceans. Because earth was sitting on top of it. You'd have some seas, but a whole lot of land just sitting on the top, resting. What means that you do not have if it's on top of water? There's no such thing as an earthquake. Because there's no such thing as rain, what does that mean? No such thing as a storm. No such thing as a blizzard. No such thing as a tornado. No such thing as a hurricane. Why do we have all of these natural disasters? Because of the flood. What God created was a paradise. But because sin got so bad and God had to hit the reset button, what did he turn the world into to stop the extent of sin? He turned it into what we see today. What we see is not never what God wanted. It's what he allowed in order to bring the greatest glory of the cross. But he didn't make this. What he made was good. What sin did was ruin the goodness that God had created. Evil changed everything. 